Good morning. You're welcome to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. My name is Rume Paulson. It's a beautiful Monday morning here in Lagos. It's the 15th of July, 2024. How are you? How was your weekend? Well, on today's breakfast show, we'll be looking at several hot topics, one of which NLC raises alarm over its delisting from board of some federal government agencies. Another is talking about court orders Lai Mohammed to disclose agreement between the federal government and X, which is formerly known as Twitter. We'll also be taking global stories that made it to the front, front pages of our national dailies, as well as some top trending stories. But first, let's check out our quote of the day. If you don't like the road you're walking, start paving another one. That is by Dolly Parton. She is an American singer and songwriter. And she says, if you don't like the road you're walking, start paving another one. The time is now. It's okay to say, oh, you know what? I'm not making progress. But even if you're not making progress, what are the things that you're doing to ensure um, your success, really? So if you don't like the road you're walking, if you don't like where you are right now in this very minute, you can make that change. You can start to pave another road. Who said you, can, you, who said you can't do anything? Anything is possible as long as you put your mind to it. If you put the necessary steps, the efforts that it requires, you can just make it happen. So instead of complaining, instead of just sitting and saying, I am not getting headway with maybe this project or whatever it is, it is important that you start to look at options for you, the opportunities that presents itself for you to start to pave another road. And for instance, if you are someone who is in the finance sector, or you like to go into the finance sector, are you taking courses? Are you taking leadership you know, um, courses to ensure that you're a better leader? Are you trying anything that would just help you to get to that place of success that you see yourself? So it is important that even if you, everything is not you know, the best for you right now, you can make that change. The person, um, the number one person in your life, the number one person that has your best interest is yourself. Nobody can have a better interest than yourself for yourself. So it is important that you introspect and you look at where you are in life and say, where do I want to be in the next six months? Where do I want to be in the next one year? Where do I want to be in the next five years? What are your plans? And you start to, you know, the paving and other road is making plans for a different future for yourself. So if you want a bright future, or if you want a future that is just not there, it starts from now. It depends on what you do today. That will determine what your tomorrow would look like. So if you do not like the road you're walking, start paving another one. All right, that's it for our quote of the day. Let's move over to some top trending stories. This one says, no going back on Danfo Korokwe in October 1, a Lagos state government says. The Lagos state government announced it will enforce a ban on unregulated commercial buses operations, including Danfo's and Korokwe's, along the Leke Ekpe corridor um, starting October 1, 2024. The decision aligns with the Lagos State Strategic Transportation Master Plan to improve commuting experiences. State Commissioner for Transportation, Mr. Oluwa Shen Osiemi, and the Special Advisor to the Governor on Transportation, Shola Giwa, confirmed the plan, urging collaboration from bus operators and union leaders. Gewa explained that the current chaotic state of bus operations along the corridor necessitates the restructuring to integrate informal transport into the state, state's buses um, reform initiative. Solutions include deploying high-capacity buses, relocating minibuses to inner routes, re-registering and certifying all buses, and introducing an e-ticketing system. The restructuring aims to enhance safety, passenger comfort, and security along the Leki Ekwe corridor. 
The restructuring plan will be implemented in phases with transport operators required to register within two weeks at the Ministry of Transportation to receive allotted routes. Non-compliance with this new regulation will result in fines and vehicle for feature. Permanent Secretary to the Ministry, Mr. Olawale Musa, emphasized that the Leki Ekwe Expressway will serve as a pilot test for transportation standardization in Lagos. To manage truck movements and prevent congestion within the Leki Ekwe Free Trade Zone corridor, the Lagos State Government will implement an e call up system starting August 1, 2024. This system, an advanced digital platform, aims to regulate truck entry and exit by scheduling their movements, thereby enhancing logistics efficiency and ensuring free movement within one of Lagos' critical economic zones. Well, great work um, from the Lagos State Government. Of course, every time we always um, look for better means in our nation. So if we're talking restructuring, if we're looking for ways to have better infrastructure, if we're looking for development, um, it's always a great cause. And, you know, it's commendable. It's commendable that they're looking at this corridor because a lot of, um, you know, development is going on around the Lekki Ekwe Expressway. So it is important that if we're saying we are a metro city, a mega city, whatever we call it, a cosmopolitan city, we need to look like one. If Lagos claims to be that cosmopolitan city, then it needs to have initiatives like this that makes it um, look like the cosmopolitan city that it claims to be. So having these buses are great. Another thing in this story that I saw was the fact that, you know, even the drive of these corridors and downfalls right now can come register because when I first saw it my question was so what happens to those people because we don't really have a lot of jobs in Nigeria um, job creation isn't something that we say as long as you go to school or if you learn a trade you definitely have a job waiting for you it's not that way so most times people have to be creative on how to put food on their tables now I don't know what the plan is, you know, for the Lagos State Government and um, these drivers, because I don't know if they're going to have jobs for all of these drivers. So all the other people who might not get in, what happens to them? How do they feed their families? So I think that this initiative is great, but on one hand, when you're trying to look for restructuring and having to strategize with things like this, you should also have um, something on the other hand for these people, an alternative means, an alternative source of income for them. So what you're just doing is deploying them into something else. Because at the end of the day, you want a nation that is safe for everyone. And most times when people don't have jobs, it can lead them into crime. I'm not saying crime is great, but sometimes when your back is up against the world, you don't have you don't have anything to do. You might just be tempted and we don't want them to be tempted. So it is important that as they are looking at this, they're still thinking of ways to ensure that these people are gainfully employed. And that's the word, gainfully employed, not just, you know, being out on the streets and looking for um, how to just maybe beg people for money or tax people for money because you see of all of these agueros, that's what they do. And you don't want these people being pushed to that. At least they have something that helps them put food in their tables, which is having to drive these buses. But when this restructuring starts in October 1st, what happens to that source of income for them? For the ones that will get in, of course, great news. But for the ones that will not, there should be an alternative source. But once again, kudos to the Lagos state government for this. And I think other states should also look at this. I mean, if you look at other parts of the, of the world, if you look at the UK, the US, you see that they have bus transport systems. They have railway systems, systems that work. And these are the kind of systems that we want. I also love the fact that they talked about e-ticketing. So, you know, we were already in a digital age and it is important that you want things made easy for you, especially with the tap of a button with a tap on your phone, you can easily get a ticket, you can move as quickly as possible. So it is great that they're also looking at this, they're incorporating technology into our lives. And finally, they talked about the trucks. On the Lega, um, on the, on the Leki Ekwe Expressway, you see a lot of trucks moving around. And sometimes they even 
deploy them, deplo uh, make the roads deplorable. Like the, the roads are so bad because these trucks are moving and then you see accidents happening on the way. There's sometimes when I'm coming to work early in the morning and you just see these trucks have probably had accidents at night and before they are being taken away, it causes traffic. So I love the fact that they're saying and you need to be able to have a call-up system whereby they know that at this point in time, they tell you when to pass those routes to ensure that there's a free, free flow of traffic um, in that area. So kudos to the Lagos State Government for thinking of all of these initiatives. I mean, it is your job to do that, but in a nation when we, those, we don't see a lot of that, we have to commend you for doing your job. And we just expect that you would do more. So it shouldn't stop with, a, with this transport system. I know there is the railway, there's the blue line and the red line, and we just want a lot more initiatives whereby we have better transport systems in Lagos, especially knowing that Lagos is one of the most populated cities in Nigeria and people are coming in day in, day out. So it is important that we can cater for all of these people. Well, you've started with transport system. We hope that you will do something with housing, which we will also commend you about. All right, another top trending story. This one is a sad one and talks about attacks in Delta communities. In recent weeks, the residents of the Anyoma ethnic communities in Delta State, Nigeria, have been under siege from kidnappers causing severe distress and disruptions in the region. Traditional rulers from a Delta North raised alarms over rampant kidnappings targeting farmers and citizens. Despite their warnings, the situation has deteriorated with numerous individuals abducted for ransom and some even killed. In Delta Central, similar issues persist with herder kidnappers and suspected youths exacerbating the plight of residents. In the Ika South local government area, specifically Abavo, attacks intensified over the past year. Over 10 people, including Elder Francis Amamusa, a former PDP chairman, have been killed and about 50 others kidnapped, with ransoms often demanded. The situation reached a tragic climax when suspected herdsmen recently killed a farmer, Mr. Friday Jigbefume, and kidnapped his wife, demanding a 20 million naira ransom. Community leaders and residents have expressed their despair. Pastor Justin Onyebe, president, of, president general of Abavo Clan Union, highlighted the community's inability to farm, the increased kidnappings, and the terror inflicted by armed herdsmen. The local vigilantes, though making efforts, are outmatched, and the sophisticated weaponry of the kidnappers um, have just taken over. Onyebe has appealed for the establishment of an army barracks to provide security. Felix Oku, a member of the Abavo Security Committee, described the dire economic impact, noting that farming activities have ceased and fear has crippled daily life. Residents are unable to invest crops or go about their business due to constant threat of kidnapping. Vincent Oconta, Security General of the Abavo Clan Union, emphasized the need for urgent government intervention to prevent further loss of life and livelihood. The community's plea highlights the severity of insecurity crisis and the immediate need for robust security measures to restore safety and normalcy. I've always said here that um, the primary responsibility of the government is for security and welfare. Now, you're hearing of kidnappings, you're hearing of theft, you're hearing of banditry, herdsmen, unknown gunmen, so many words being thrown, you know, just about. And why are we not tackling security the way we should? How do we want to have a better nation if people are scared? If, if farmers are even scared to go to their farms, how are we supposed to get food? We keep crying about food insecurity, shortage of food supply. But that's because we're not even planting. Some of them can't even go into their farms to plant. Some of them are just going to be at home. They can't even have food on their table because they cannot do anything and they're not making any money. So it is imperative that the government really looks at, at you know, security and try to tackle it. I want to believe they're doing their best, but as of right now, the best isn't good enough. Because right now, we're talking about Delta States. Earlier this year, there were so many kidnappings, so many killings in the north. And right now, you're seeing it in the south as well. So what does that tell us? What is that, what is that saying about our nation? Especially if we want to have a good outlook abroad. 
if the president is going to different nations and asking them to come invest in our country, looking for investors everywhere, why do you think they will come to a country whereby they don't feel safe, the expatriates they might probably bring here are not safe, they might get kidnapped? These are many questions that they're going to ask. So if we don't start to tackle inflation, if we don't start to tackle um, security, I beg your pardon, there is no way we will have a growing and thriving nation economically the way we want it to be. And that's just on one hand. Nobody wants to bury their loved ones, mourn their loved ones, just because maybe due to kidnapping, something that could be averted. Because another thing is, like I said earlier, most times you, if you don't have food on your table, a hungry man is an angry man. And your back is up against the wall. You might just go into things that are illegal, that are criminal, that, you know, just don't even sit well with your conscience just because you're trying to put food on your table. I know that there are greedy people out there who, regardless of whatever amount they make, they just see it as a thriving business. But there are still some people who got into these things because they had no choice. And it is important that we're creating jobs. It is important that we're ensuring that we're, there is sensitization. You're letting people know that. No matter what, you shouldn't go the wrong way. You shouldn't be against the legal things of a nation. And kidnapping and killing is one of them. There is no reason whatsoever why you should kill someone because you're trying to make ends meet. That is not a job. That is not a job. You can go out there, you can buy something, sell to another. That is a job. So regardless of whatever the situation is, you should still be able to be creative to put food on your table. But still, the government needs to have a thriving environment for you to be creative. So it is important. And also, what are we doing with um, security forces in certain areas? Though these people are crying for, um, you know, a police barracks being, um, an army barracks being put there because they need their lives to be secured. Why don't we have army barracks in several places in the country? What are we doing about state police? I mean, it is a conversation that is being um, had as of right now. Well, it needs to be facilitated so that people can feel safe. Local vigilantes are doing their best, but it's not good enough because most of these herdsmen, bandits, terrorists, kidnappers, they have ammunition that you cannot even believe that they would have. So it is important that the government is putting security forces there that can ensure the, the safety of people, that can ensure that the lives and properties of Nigerians are safe. And we, you know, my heart goes out to the people of Delta State who are facing all of this right now. I am also from Delta State, and I hope that um, pretty soon, um, we'll all be safe, not just in Delta, up north as well, here in the south, everywhere. We will be safe. We'll have a Nigeria that is safe for everyone. All right, final top trending story. Petroleum marketers, tankers, drivers threaten to shut down operations in Oshun and Oyo. Stakeholders in the petroleum industry in Oyo, Oshun State and environs have threatened to halt operations if a driver and a truckload of diesel detained by the Inspector General of Police IGP monitoring team at Bogon, Oshun State are not released immediately. At an emergency stakeholders meeting, leaders from the Independent Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigerian IPMAN and the Petroleum Tanker Drivers Branch of Nupeng expressed frustration over repeated harassment and extortion by the IGP monitoring team, which they argue is overstepping its regulatory role. Alaji Bukola Mutu, chairman of the stakeholders, narrated how the tanker loaded in Lagos and, and heading to Oshobo was detained at Bogon Junction by the IGP monitoring team, exaggerating the ongoing challenges of petrol unavailability. The stakeholders have called on the Oshin State Commissioner of Police to release the detained driver and tanker, warning that failure to do so will result in the suspension of all petroleum products loading operations to Oyo and Oshin States, potentially disrupting fuel supply in the region. Now, when there are threats like this, we ha always have to take it seriously because with something like this, if they halt operations, of course, who is going to suffer? The people. The people who need this product to go about their, their, their days and their weeks and, you know, their business, really. Most times, we depend on petrol to be able to fuel our cars, to be able to fuel our generators, to be able to do business as well. So it is important that, you know, 
Well, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say release this person. If there are certain investigations that have been done that have that requires this person to be detained, yes, the person should face the, the justice system. But if it was just, you know, taken just because and at the end of the day, because what, something they, they also talked about was saying you, the jurisdiction is not even in your role. It's not in your purview to actually detain this person. So I feel like um, proper, proper investigation needs to be done if this person has defaulted in any way. Because it is important that we make examples or else people will just feel like they can do anything and get away with it. So if this person has done something that is not right well he should face the justice system but if he's if he's supposed to be cleared please clear the man because you don't want a situation whereby the the people of ocean state the people of all your state they just can't have a product that you're so dependent on that helps their daily lives so i think it is important that you know we look at this and hopefully this man will be released as quickly as possible and if he was found guilty of anything of any sort he will face the justice system